Welcome everyone. Know that everyone's still probably going to be trickling in here for a minute or two. Okay. That looks like just about everyone right now. I'm sure some more people will uh, uh, jump in as we as we get going. I don't want to uh, take up too much time waiting for everyone, but uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wes. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this event. Um, and I just wanted to just start by welcoming all of you um, to this Alumni 101 event series, Jobs, 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 how to refine your job search with thousands of openings. Um, I'm really excited to moderate this panel um, of really talented uh, individuals and alumni um, and try to help all of you. I was uh, a student in your shoe, shoes not too long ago. Um, and so I really hope that we can provide both some practical advice um, to everyone here that you can walk away knowing just how to start this job search, how to brand yourself and how to stand out. But um, perhaps even more importantly, just walk away a little bit more at ease mentally. Um, I know that a lot of you might be suffering from the title of this event, right? There are just so many jobs out there. There's so many companies. I don't know what to choose, but I'm sure a lot of you have the opposite problem as well. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to do next, um, and I don't really see anything that excites me. So I, I hope that um, the range of kind of panelists that we have here is going to give you a little bit more insight. Um, and so just to, to kind of get into this and, and who you're going to be hearing from most of today, um, we have Mike Zucker, um, on the call. Mike, do you just want to quickly introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, certainly. Thank you, Wes. Thank you for joining us, Tritons. Uh, my name is Mike Zucker. I have the opportunity to serve as the Associate Director of Career Development and Industry Engagement in the Career Center uh, on campus. Um, shout out or raise a hand if you're registered or connected with the Career Center on Handshake. Thank you for con connecting with our services. I'm here to offer some guidance and assistance and reinforce how the Career Center can assist you as we discuss the many steps and dynamics regarding an effective job search. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you, Mike. Um, you have myself. <laughs> Again, my name is Wes, um, and I'll introduce myself in a second, but I also want to put up the slide for the rest of our panelists who are really going to, to be important in this conversation. Um, and uh, I guess to start, um, you know, I'd like all of us to introduce ourselves um, in a little bit more detail, just talk a little bit about who you are, um, your education and, and background. Um, one of the questions that came in uh, from one of the attendees was, what was your first job and how long did it take you to find? So if you want to throw that in there as an icebreaker and then really just what your current role is. Um, so I'll start. Again, everyone, my name is Wes. Um, I am a, a political science grad from UC San Diego, class of 2016. I double minored in history and philosophy. So I had no idea what I was going to do as a career, um, but my first job um, was straight out of school. I got lucky enough um, to be able to, to land an internship that turned into a full-time job at a recruiting firm in San Diego doing technology recruiting. Uh, I was in Warren College, so all my friends were engineers. I think that, that probably helped uh, me actually have conversations with more engineers. Um, and currently I find myself as the senior recruiter at I'm Aware which is an at-home medical testing startup uh, based in Austin, Texas. So uh, it's a little bit darker here than uh, where y'all are in most part in San Diego, um, but that's just a little bit about me and, and I'm gonna pass it over um, to our panelists. So Melissa, let's start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Arneson and I graduated from Eleanor Roosevelt College in 2010. I have a bachelor's degree in art history, theory and criticism and a minor in communications. And similar to Wes, I thought I was going to work in a museum in the communications department. And I had an internship that was exactly that here at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. And I decided that wasn't the career path for me. So great thing to learn in an internship. My first professional opportunity actually came about when I was still a student at UC San Diego. I did the super senior fifth year, which was one of the best things I had ever done. Um, it gave me an opportunity to get a lot of different experience. Um, I was an intern with International House and the provost of Eleanor Roosevelt College needed an interim executive assistant. Um, so I did that my spring quarter and that uh, turned into my first professional job. 
And over that course of time, I had some different roles within the college. Um, fast forward about 10 years later, currently I am a digital marketing specialist at Prana. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Prana is an apparel company. They've been around for a long time. Um, really the focus there is sustainable clothing. So it's not only just making clothing, but clothing for positive change. So how does the clothing that we're creating, um, how is it not as detrimental to the environment? Um, so I'll speak more about that and what I do there um, as we go through the panel, but super excited to be here and share my experiences. Thank you, Melissa. Let's throw it over to Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me too. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, my name is Kristen Givanello. I am a campus relations manager here at Intel. Um, prior, I've been at Intel for about three and a half years. I was doing recruiting at Intel um, and then moved into the campus relations manager role. Prior to Intel, I was at another semiconductor company. They make testers, automatic test equipment. And I worked in um, HR the entire time. I was in benefits, a comp analyst, an HR business partner. And then they started uh, moving my husband around. And so they said, hey, can you do recruiting from wherever you are? <laughs> so I've actually been doing work from home since 2005 before we had all these great tools and things like that. Um, I graduated from a small liberal arts women's college in Boston, Massachusetts called Regis College. I was a social work major. Um, I thought I would, I, I during my internships um, at Regis, I did different types of social work. And so I really thought I wanted to do medical social work. And in your senior year, you have to do a year long internship with whatever type you know, you're, you're interested in. So I did it in, in, in <laughs> and, and was bored and said, Oh my gosh, this isn't, you know, what I want to do. I graduated uh, thinking, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And I had been temping in the summers. Um, I was temping at, you know, I worked at a hospital in radiology. And then the last few summers I worked at a, a light bulb company called Phillips lighting started as a switchboard operator, then they moved me to purchasing, then accounting, and then they fired the HR person and said, come on, you're doing HR. <laughs> and so I ended up um, not knowing anything. I didn't even know what was HR. What, what's the, we called it personnel back then. And um, I just really enjoyed whatever this personnel work was that I was doing. And um, started going back for, you know, summers and, and winter breaks and spring breaks. Um, and when I graduated from Regis, I, I knew I didn't want to do social work. And um, the company said, hey, why don't you, you know, we're closing down, we're moving to Virginia, but come and help us close the facility down. So my resume went into a resume book. This is back in the 90s. They used to send out resume books when they were having big layoffs my the resume book went to this company by the name of Teradyne. they called me and said hey it looks like you have hr experience and i'm like do i i don't know <laughs> and that's how i i got my first job working at, at i went from i grew up with all girls i have uh, four older sisters i went to an all women's college and Teradyne was primarily all men so um yeah that's how i uh got my first job and even got into HR pretty much by accident. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Kristen. Um, Christine, let, let's uh, wrap up with you and then we'll, we'll start diving into some of these topics. Happily. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Christine Siebold. Um, I am a biz ops manager at Intuit. Um, you may have heard of them. They own products like uh, QuickBooks, TurboTax, Mint, recently Credit Karma and MailChimp um, with the goal of powering prosperity around the world by supporting small businesses. Um, I graduated from Ravel class of 2014. Um, my degree was in psychology and my, um, my first job kind of ties into the rest of my um, education because my first role out of UCSD was as a human resources coordinator. Um, it was the only job that I found by purely uh, 
sending out my resume on LinkedIn. Every other job has been from networking. But as a graduating senior, I had no idea how to network. So I just email blasted my resume to anyone that would take it and not block me um, and ended up in an HR coordinator position that made me realize how interested I was in operational efficiencies and um, and human practices in the workplace. So I went on and I got my master's in industrial and organizational psychology from San Diego State. Um, and then similar to others, I thought that I knew what I wanted to do forever. So I went into consulting and I consulted for several years across different companies. I started as a workplace scientist for Gallup. Then I moved to work for a giant tech consultancy based in Chicago called West Monroe, doing customer experience strategy work with Fortune 500 companies. And now I'm into it, and I am no longer a consultant. Um, <laughs> so yet another example of how your, your path can wind and still be successful and fulfilling. Um, I've been with Intuit for the past four months or so. So this is a fairly recent transition for me. But um, this is, I think, either my fourth or fifth year on this panel. So um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to ask some, um, but uh, I hope everyone got a sense of um, some unique backgrounds that we have in some of the, the panelists today. All of us have uh, had a number of different careers and even jobs and responsibilities um, at this point. So um, to jump into some of the questions here, um, I want to start by really just getting started. Um, this can be the, the biggest barrier for, I think, a lot of uh, new grads um, or people about to graduate, right? How do I even begin my job search? Um, and I don't want that to, to be a, a too high of a barrier for entry. And so I want to start by throwing some questions at Kristen because of your recruiting background, right? You understand a lot of what employers are, are looking for and, and how candidates can set themselves up for success. So this is a little broad. <laughs> I'm just going to start by asking you know, when you're starting your job search, what are some maybe checklist items um, that you would want to get off the list when it comes to, to resumes or LinkedIn profiles um, that, that you would kind of advise the, the, the you know, students or, or new grads? Yeah, great question, Wes, and, and one I get all the time. Um, I get this not only from college students, but uh, friends of mine that had been out of the workforce for a long time raising their families and now want to get back in. Um, there's a few things that I, I tend to say that, that are must-haves. I do think link, having a LinkedIn profile is a, a must-have, right? Um, I do think any students that are even, you know, people think, oh, a freshman, that's too soon to have a LinkedIn profile. I had my daughter start a LinkedIn profile when she was in 10th grade. Um, and what I realized that the LinkedIn profile does, as you start putting information on there, you're building your resume. Whereas back when I was, it was like, oh, I got to get a resume together. I got to dust it off. So just like LinkedIn allows you to have, it becomes your Rolodex, right? And you connect with people, you know, people you worked with, family members, someone that maybe you did business with. Um, starting your LinkedIn profile sooner rather than later um, has that compounding effect. And I think it's really important to have a LinkedIn profile. And for anybody that's in college, I'll tell you before I became this campus relations manager, I didn't realize the power of handshake. I didn't even know, I knew at my old company that I used to send jobs to our admin and say, get this posted at these schools. She used to mention this thing called handshake, didn't know what it, what it was. Um, we use Handshake all the time. We use it to post jobs, send messages to students. So um, I think continuing with your Handshake profile, even after you gra graduate, it's primarily, I think, focused on students currently enrolled. But I think even we still send messages to alumni through Handshake for, you know, two, three, four, five years out. So I think having a LinkedIn profile and starting to build that in college with people you met, friends from high school, professors, um, anybody that you worked with at your internships or, or any of your jobs. And I think it was Christine that mentioned she was kind of, you know, doing different roles. There's something I just want to say about that, that I loved that really resonated with me because I have so many people that will say, can you talk to my sister, my nephew, my cousin, da, da, da. They, they don't know what they want to do when they're in college. Fear not. I think 
doing what Christine did or temping and trying different companies, trying different roles, you know, swimming with the fish and feeling out the waters of, you know, do you like that company culture? Do you like the role that you're doing? Um, I just think it's, I wish it was a requirement that students had to do a temp job from, you know, 11th grade till they graduated from college, because it really lets you taste a whole bunch of different cultures. And, and you've got to bring your whole self to wherever you're going, and you'll know that you fit. So I probably a little long winded, but <laughs> LinkedIn profile handshake and, and temp and rotate yourself if you can. Yeah. yeah, to to add on to that, because um, I, I want some people to take some very specific things away from, um, the, especially the LinkedIn piece, um, because I, I get asked all the time um, from, you know, friends, family, candidates, uh, it, it, should I have a certain length to my resume? In fact, it was actually one of the questions that was also asked um, of one of the students or, or uh, recent alumni um, that joined us today. Um, and And my response to that is like, yes, your, your resume should be limited, I think, like no one should have more than three pages. And I think if you're in college, all you've done is internships, there really isn't much of a reason to go over one. But if there's things and details and meaty stuff that you have to leave off of a resume so that you can try to be more concise, LinkedIn is the place to put it. There is no page limit on LinkedIn, everyone. And so if you look at my LinkedIn profile, it is full of a lot of bullet points that I likely will never put on a resume to add, and, and it acts as a sort of source of truth for me, right? When I've gotten ready for a job search, I've kind of used that as a master template to pick and choose the right bullet points for the right job, for the right company. And so as you're building your LinkedIn, I, I would recommend that, yes, you should prioritize certain content, things that are maybe most important kind of towards the top in, in whatever section um, you know, that you're talking about, but feel free to use that as more of a laundry list of things, whereas your resume is maybe a little bit more tailored to the specific job or, or industry or whatever that, that you're applying for. Um, and so I think that having those set um, initially are going to be a couple of really good boxes to check before you even start looking at job descriptions, and before you even start really trying to find out what, you know, what's going to be my, my next opportunity. Um, I do want to open this up to the rest of the group as well, right? In, in, in terms of creating a person, go one, ahead. <laughs> one quick thing. I do think once students are masters or PhD, their, their, res, their, yeah, their resumes might be a bit longer, especially if they publish papers and things like that. So it might be more on the two to three page if they're first author. Um, so we never kind of snark if it's a PhD student that has a lot of publications. Um, because that research work, at least at Intel, is really interesting to the hiring managers, even at the master's level where they get into project work. And just one other thing I want to say about resumes, I always tell students have two of them, have a boring resume, and then have one that might be a little more graphically pleasing and all that if you're marketing, because all of these resumes, when you're applying to jobs, tend to go into applicant tracking systems. And it is 2022, and I would hope that the technology is better and, and the, the AIs are able to really understand how to place your info. But I have students that give me these beautiful resumes where their contact information's to the left and other information's to the right. And it looks so great, but then when we try to have it in our system, it gets all garbled. Um, so I always think it's great to have two resumes. Uh, if you have a beautiful resume, keep it. Don't get rid of it. And you can email that to whoever you're interviewing with or bring that to your interview, but also have a boring one that can go in the system that kind of has your name. You don't need to have your exact street address anymore. The less personal data, the better. Um, your state, your city, a uh, phone number, and a link to your LinkedIn profile. So just want to mention that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Melissa, Christine, any, any things that kind of come to mind in terms of some of those checklist items that, that you kind of just want to have squared away and, and tips and advice before people even really get into their job search? Yeah. Melissa, do you mind if I go for it? Yeah, okay. go for it. A few things. Um, one, your resume should be a PDF. Um, if it's not a PDF, it could look really pretty on your side and really wonky on the side of the person that you are trying to impress. And the best way to get around that is to have a PDF. These are sort of 
minute, but these are things I've learned and then burned from embarrassment with. I was like, oh, did I ruin this opportunity because I did these things wrong? So hopefully they're helpful to set up. Um, if you always make sure to put your LinkedIn on your resume. And when you're putting things into a PDF, you can turn things into hyperlinks that will remain hyperlinks in the PDF. And that makes it so much easier for the hiring manager to quickly understand who you are and to reduce the cognitive load on them to figure out if they want to interview you. So you can do things that are feel really fancy, but are actually like a three click approach. Like you can change your LinkedIn URL to be specific to your name. I think mine is Christine Siebold. So it's really easy to share with others. Um, and those little things make, they make a real difference. Um, the other thing I'll say is I am someone who has a resume for every single company that I am pursuing, every role that I am pursuing. Don't freak out. It sounds like a lot of work. You build a template and then you can actually save for specific jobs in the, you know, the extension of your file name. And this has a huge impact on your reception when it comes to receiving feedback from a talent team for a job that you're interested in, because it's pretty transparent to, to talent teams if you've just email blasted your resume. But if you've tailored the details so that even the language matches the language in the job requisition, you automatically overcome so many hurdles that stand between you and the hiring manager visualizing you in that position. Um, I could go on about LinkedIn for a year. So Melissa, you take it from here. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you both have on some amazing things. I saw one question come through about adding relevant coursework. And I thought that was an interesting question. Um, and that was something I actually did incorporate in my second round of job searching. So just a side note, um, I actually transitioned careers paths. I was on an international education trajectory in higher education for about six years. And then I decided to pivot and go into corporate world and specifically into marketing. So, you know, looking at a resume, giving myself, you know, some additional information um, to beef that section up, I did find it helpful to list out specifically some of my marketing courses that I took that were part of my communications minor. So I did want to call that out. Obviously, the primary focus was work that I had done, whether or not in my previous roles or in different um organs and groups when I was at UCSD that related to marketing, but I did have a chunk um, for my coursework. And I believe I also had that on LinkedIn for a while, um, just to call that out, because I did have some specific courses that I felt were relevant, like advertising. Um, and I also wanted to mention too, on resumes, you know, as you're a college student, you, you have experience um, both academically, and I'm sure extracurricularly. I personally shifted a lot of my focus, my fourth year and fifth year to getting really involved in camp on campus. And that's that looks different for everyone. Um, but if you are in a club or organization, don't be afraid to put that on there. Maybe give it a small bullet into what you did specifically. Um, I had a lot of different involvement, mostly with International House, um, but within my major as well. So for example, um, I worked on a project at the Children's Museum through one of my courses, and I led the marketing efforts for our opening um, exhibitions. So I made sure to call that out. Um, I did a on the ground um, campaign with Comic-Con um, back in 2010. So, you know, that was a marketing initiative. It was the guerrilla marketing initiative. You know, I was young passing out flyers, um, but it was relevant when I was talking about, you know, what job I was applying to. So those are just different things I think are really helpful. You might have to, again, explain it because not every employer is going to be familiar with your lingo. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to add that on there. I've seen different resumes when I've been in the position of hiring people where I'm like, hey, we have that in common. Or it could be, you know, a side note to chat about before or after your interview. Yeah, don't these are all... Personal. No, those are all really, really good points. Um, I, I know we spent a lot of time here. I'm going to give just a, a couple of quick things as well, because it was called out in the, the chat to save your resume as first name, last name, resume. I'm also going to add the suggestion of the company name and potentially the job title as well yes. to Christine's point, like not only tailoring your resume, obviously the order of your accomplishments, um, 
also in the same order as the job description itself. But even if like your general resume is already a perfect match for this job, giving the illusion that you have tailored it is also maybe just as important. <laughs> and so titling it with that specific company name and title also because you're sending out like maybe 15 different versions of your resume, you know which one they have if you move forward with an interview. It's another really important thing to have. Yeah, Christine. One quick little tip. Um, I started doing this for all of my resumes when I was pursuing new roles. The top right corner, I would say um, prepared for, and then I would have the company logo in the top right corner. Um, Intuit loved that. If nothing else, it's just a measure that you're, you're taking the time to tailor things. So it's kind of a show of respect for the person that's reviewing your resume on the other side. So there are many ways to get creative with it, but you can also feel free to be a little creative as long as you're not, not going too far off the rails. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. Um, and, and the last thing I, I will say, and I know this is particularly hard if you, um, you know, your only experience is academic. Um, but if you do have any internship experience or, or kind of anything else uh, throughout your career, I highly recommend everyone to think of their resume, not as a list of roles and responsibilities, but a list of your accomplishments. And your accomplishments are quantifiable. And there are only three reasons why you are ever going to be hired and paid a salary. You either make money, save money, or save time. That's it. So as much as you can quantify those three things in previous work experiences that you have saved money, you have saved time, or you had made money, that is the meat and potatoes. And so hopefully once you've kind of checked those boxes, you can actually get into the, the meat of your job search itself, right? And so I wanna talk about searching and identifying and then actually going about and, and applying to some of these jobs. We talked a lot about the applying and maybe things that you can do at that stage, but even just finding the right job can, again, you know, be daunting. And so I want to pass it over to Melissa um, because she spoke a little bit before about networking and how she was able to find the, those jobs. I know it sounds hard right now, especially maybe young in a lot of people's careers, but Melissa, I guess, how would you emphasize the importance of networking? And if you're new to it, how to even kind of get started and, and get your name out there? Yeah, absolutely. So every single job I've ever gotten, except for the one currently I have, um, i was able to get due to people I knew. So obviously I, I got the job on my own merit and credit, but it was all through networking. So I'm a big believer in this. And you might be thinking like, okay, I'm a student. Maybe I've been super hyper-focused on my academics. I haven't had a lot of time to get out there to network. We're also in this weird virtual world. Where do I start? So one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was network with your peers. And that might sound weird, but your peer group is the group of people you are gonna come up with in the workforce. So your peer group is gonna be the executives and the managers in 10, 15 years, those are the people that are gonna be rising through the career trajectory with you. And I love that advice because I would say that my UCSD um, alumni friends and people that I've met over the course of years, maybe I didn't know them at UCSD, but I've met them um, in the last 10 years. Those are the people that I really look at, at like, wow, I'm really interested in what they're doing. Like they seem to have really interesting and cool jobs. And, you know, I think another good thing too to keep in mind is keep your peer group and others. Maybe you have mentors or professors or people that you've interned with, keep them in the know of what you're interested in. So some of my closest mentors are like, okay, well, this is where you're at right now. Where are you going? And that's such a hard question. But if you can start outlining, like this is what I'm really good at this is what I'm open to. This is where I'd maybe like to see myself in five, 10 years. They can help guide you there. And oftentimes they can bring in different opportunities that might not be tomorrow or, you know, in the next month or year, but they can circle back. You'd be amazed at what comes back in two, three, four years. So going back to like what, you know, you're looking for a job currently, if you're in a like ground zero networking spot, you need to start now. Um, LinkedIn is a great spot. You know, it can feel a little bit like a cold call, you know, reach out to someone, tell them who you are, say why you're interested in their work, what they're currently doing. If you can follow anything else that they're doing in this space, um, I'd encourage calling that out. 
I'm a big fan of informational interviews. Again, this has helped me land quite a few of my jobs. Um, my job, I, after I worked at UCSD, um, I really wanted to work at International House, and the largest one is in New York City. I had actually done an informational interview with the president after I graduated, and I was on a trip out there and got connected um, by the UCSD uh, director and had that in interview and or informational interview two years later there was my dream job open and um i had talked to some other people in the office and said i'm interested in applying they were not a fan that i was in california They're like, you're never going to come to new york don't don't worry about applying and so i actually took my resume and funneled that straight to the director i had met you know a couple years prior and Two days later, I had a phone interview. So again, like great opportunity to like talk to people. Same thing with my internship at the Museum of Contemporary Art. I had gone to several of their events and um, really liked what they were doing. And I reached out to their communications team and said, hey, I'm interested in how does your role work at the museum? Again, I wasn't saying I want a job or I want X, Y, and Z, but like, let me learn from you. Um, so that's where I think you can build a lot of networking. Sorry, I realized I was muted. Um, that last part right there, um, you know, Sam was asking to define informational interview. It's it's really that last part, right? Um, it, it's reaching out to someone to request more time to ask questions, right? To get information, and you know, people like talking about themselves, like they just do. If you know, especially if they're higher, like further along in their career, and they enjoy what they're doing. So you asking them about how they got there you know, what were the hardships, what were the best parts about their job, they're going to shut like light up and, and want to, to share that information. So don't don't hesitate to request those types of things. If you're lucky enough to maybe know what you want to do in five to 10 years, find that person with that dream job and reach out to them on LinkedIn. But there's plenty of other ways to find out how to go about this, right? And, and, and the next steps to go. And so I wanted to throw it over to Christine, who had a variety of different, you know, careers and, and things that she was doing. And so I guess, you know, I guess what, what, what is the value of just giving it a shot, Christine? Like, how, you know, <laughs> when you don't know what you're doing, when you're minoring in random things, like, how do you, how do you start to put it together? One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was that you learn as much or more by the things that don't work out than you do by the ones that do work out. Um, you learn a lot more about the company, about the role, about the space you're working in, but specifically you learn a whole lot about yourself. Um, and, I, and I mean that with, obviously there are parts of job transitions that can really stink and there can be identity crises around, identity crises around oh, I thought this was it for me. Crap, this is not it for me. What does this mean about me? All it really means is you're still the same you, you still have just as much value, but you're realizing, okay, this is, this is Mr. Right now, not Mr. Right. Um, and that's also, I just want to double down on the benefit of informational interviews. Um, every job I've gotten since that first one that was just tossing resumes in the wind to see what would stick has always come from informational interviews. Wes, you hit the nail on the head. People, people love hearing the sound of their own voice. So if you engage with somebody to ask them about what excites them about their job um, in a way that is gracious and comes from a position of humility, you're almost always going to be successful. Um, and I'll even take it a step further. I mean, your gut will tell you if like it's kind of a mismatch between you and the person that you're speaking with. But unless you're getting those warning bells, my observation has been that anybody that takes the time to opt into an informational interview as like the host who knows more is almost certainly willing to refer you if they feel like you do diligence, you know what you want, you're respectful and humble and gracious of the person's time, you operate with high integrity. And one of, the key, um, one of the key ways that I see people fail with informational interviews, I mean that with no judgment, is that they start to get imposter syndrome in the last five to 10 minutes and they fail to ask the question, 
that the person hosting the informational interview is waiting to hear, which is, you know, I'm really interested in this job rec. Do you know the hiring manager? Would, would you be willing to connect me with that person or refer me? And I have found that when I've fumbled the bag in that way, that they sort of just blink at me over Zoom, like, well, do you want my help? <laughs> and so my encouragement is, if somebody is willing to take an informational interview with you, they've already agreed in their mind that you are worth that portion of their time. And if you operate with high integrity throughout the course of that conversation, they have no reason not to continue. Um, so it's a call to courage, which is hard. <laughs> I don't mean to undervalue it, but it is, I think the statistic now is that more than 90% of jobs are, are filled through networking rather than you know, resume blasting. And that's a crucial step is allowing the person to help you. That, that's fantastic. I, I, I think a lot of what we've covered so far, I hope is going to give everyone so far a, a way to stand apart, um, whether it be how you're, you're constructing your LinkedIn profile, uh, your resumes, um, and, and reaching out to the right people just to kind of get you on the right track. Um, I do want to touch upon one question that came in during registration about the actual application process, because this is something kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, someone was asking about assessing job requirements for fit and qualifications, you know, when to know like if you're a good enough fit um, or when maybe it's too much of a reach. So I, I'm going to my privilege here for a second as a middle-class white male, um, where every study ever has shown that my demographic feels very comfortable applying to jobs that they fit about 40 to 60% of the requirements for. Whereas other minority populations, um, people of color um, and women, particularly in the technology space, do not feel comfortable unless they meet at least 80% of a job's requirements. And so personally, that sucks. <laughs> like I, I hate that statistic so much. And so I want people to feel comfortable shooting out an application regardless of whether or not you are the perfect match for a job. Um, and I, I, I hope that the, the advice that we have given everyone today, at least to this point, will give some people the confidence to give it a shot, right? Because they tailored the resume a bit more or they just reached out to some extra people. But I am kind of curious if there are any thoughts from the group here um, because this was something that, yes, Kristen, please. Oh yes, my <laughs> God, I, I love that. And by the way, Christine, I love this, it might not be Mr. Right, but right now, I love that. Um, Wes, that is so true. First of all, very few times is there a perfect target because the job descriptions sometimes are job descriptions that have been in the works for years and years and haven't evolved um, and things have changed and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I can, in, in my 30 plus years of, you know, I've always had my hand in recruiting, maybe not always full time, but um, very rarely have has the, the target been 100%. Here's the job description and, and the candidate is 100%. And still then it doesn't matter because the person can come and say, I don't like my boss. I don't like the culture. I hate what I'm doing. This isn't <laughs> as advertised. Um, and as women, I, I will tell you, this is something I suffered from my entire career. I was always, I, I remember when I was working at my old company and um, I was working a ton of hours and this woman came to me and said, Kristen, I want you to apply for this compensation job as a comp analyst. And I was like, what, me? I'm not analytical. <clears throat> Even though I've always been pretty sharp at math, I just thought she's out of her mind. Um, I ended up doing it. Um, and I was scared to death. So the whole time I was in compensation, I was take, getting a second degree in finance at uh, Salem State College because I thought imposter <laughs> syndrome. Um, I didn't like compensation. I hated it. I hated working in comp. And sometimes I had a tough time going in, but I'll tell you, I learned a ton. And Part of it is I went outside my comfort zone. And when we go outside of our comfort zone, it's messy. It's uncomfortable. 
it's scary. And it's also the time when we grow the most. So absolutely shoot for that. I was double, I, I almost last minute said to Intel, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to come because I had been at my old job for 28 years. And, and I think I had kind of developed there, you know, no other place would take me. I've been at this place, you know, I know everybody. Um, and to your point, Wes, oh my gosh, I, w- I, I like my old company, but I wish I had left and had the courage to jump 10 years prior. I wish I had come to, ter- uh, to Intel 10 years prior, to be quite honest. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable, but that's when we grow. And, and, and it doesn't always feel good being in messy, right? But sit in that messy and, and sit in the uncomfortable and it's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I want to jump why, in. Do you mind ahead. if jump in for 15 seconds? Please. The other thing I'll say is don't measure yourself against the job rack. Um, I have to pick myself up in tears several times by measuring my self-worth against job rack. Um, I can only speak for Intuit, but Intuit a lot of times doesn't even have details on the job rec. So focus first and foremost on what you bring to the table and then really viewing that job rec as a wish list rather than a checklist, knowing very well there might be a lot of things on the job rec that are, uh, Melissa or Kristen, you might have said like legacy things that were, you know, in the works for years, things that are no longer relevant. Um, Some hiring managers are closer to the hiring process than others and vice versa. So you might get varying degrees of specificity, but again, starting with yourself and what you bring to the table and then seeing if the job rec matches you closely, most closely, at least for me, it's the best way to stay sane. Absolutely. Um, Kristen, there was a a question in the chat I, I think it's going to speak to something maybe you wanted to jump in at the end work for, but it popped up. Um, but Terry Lee was asking about um, advice about uh, temping and, and getting to know a company. Were there ways to find and apply for temp jobs at Intel, Intuit, Prana? Um, I guess yes. I know that you wanted to, to, to shout out Intel for a bit. So Yeah, and I'll throw it in the chat. We have what's called a talent community, and I'm going to throw it in the chat. So you don't have to apply to a particular job, right? You can just upload your information to the talent community. And why is that good? Because all of Intel's recruiters and sources are able to to view it, share it. Um, But um, Intel has ICE jobs, right? So when I came to Intel, I left a 28-year career to do a six-month ICE assignment. That's an Intel contract employee. Um, I got benefits, health and dental benefits and things like that. which was wonderful, but there's also a ton of temp agencies out there, Kelly Agency and um, Volt and um, Judge and and CDI. There's, you know, if you just type into Google temp agencies, a lot of companies like Intel also have their own, they hire what's called uh, contractors, which can be through a temp agency, but they also hire people directly like they did with me to, to contract. So I got to swim with the fish and see, do do I like Intel? Do I like the culture? Do I fit in here? Um, And I just think that's so important to do. And the best time to do it is early on in your career. Um, But there's a ton of temp agencies. um, And you can even find out if, if you know some of the company, you can call them and say, hey, do you hire temps directly? Or is it mostly through a temp agency? So a lot of big companies will have an on-site temp agency. That's what my old company, we used um, CDI and they were our on t- on-site temp agency, but we also did hire um, Teradyne temps, just like Intel hires Intel contractors. Yeah, no, awesome. I, I think that's, that's all really good insight. I do want to keep moving because I would like to leave some time at the end for maybe some additional questions. Um, I did want to touch upon interviewing very, at least briefly, um, in terms of, you know, after you've applied, you've gotten the interview, uh, what can you do from here? So you know, talked about this a bit, Kristen mentioned just bringing your full self <laughs> into um, a job. I think that holds very true to the interview as well. If you are putting on a front in the interview, then if you get hired, you're gonna, the front is gonna get hired, not you. I think you're gonna find that you are not very happy after that. Um, 
I want to leave it open to the group. Are there any like tips and advice questions that you recommend people asking? That was something that was brought up um, in kind of the, the registration question, like things that people you know should be asking of companies as a candidate. I have I have several tips, not specific to what candidates should be asking companies. But go ahead. Yeah, I find that sometimes <laughs> role specific, but bring backup questions. Um, my stance is it's not enough to bring a few questions, bring a few more questions. Sounds a little wonky, but I've been glad every time I've gone into an interview and I've prepared five to seven questions rather than three, because if you get through a few of the questions and then your interviewer says, well, what would you like to know? It becomes very awkward if your questions have already been answered. And as somebody that is only getting a first view of a company, there should be dozens and dozens of questions that you can ask. Um, the other thing I would say is tailor your questions to who you're speaking with. If you're speaking with a recruiter, they might not have as much insight about what the culture of the team is like, but they can tell you about benefits and compensation. And then when you speak to the hiring manager, you can ask questions that are more tied to the audience that you're speaking with. Um, and to that point, if you end up in a situation where you have multiple interviews for the same company, bring new questions each time, new questions for each person you're speaking with. Um, I'll be candid, even on this recording, there have been times when I really wished I had asked more questions in my interviews. And then I've gotten into the job and a month or two months later, I go, oh, if I had thought to ask about that, it, it may have totally changed the trajectory of whether I took this job or another job. And I don't mean to sound catastrophic about it, but in this instance, I was working for, I was taking a job for a consulting firm where one person would be evaluating my performance while another person would be my manager. Sounds a little wonky because it is a little wonky. And I didn't know until after I got into the role. And I was like, oh, well, I jived really well with all of the people that I interviewed with. But now I have this manager that I've never met before, and our relationship is completely different. And this is the person that is supposed to be advocating for me, setting me up for success, helping me find new um, consulting projects, because as a consultant, you're hired full time, but your work is project based. And then you sit on the bench while you wait for a new project to start. And so through trial and error, I have learned to ask questions that I think to take for granted because it's always better to be positive than to assume and then have made a life choice that doesn't actually add up once you've got button seat. I'm gonna give, uh, I think that was fantastic, Christine. That, that, that's wonderful. I'll give two questions that I think everyone should be asking at the end of their interviews. First, any concerns regarding my match for the role or the team? Ask for honest feedback, because if someone has a potentially a flag, that is your time to try and respond, right? Or if it's an honest, like if it's a good observation, they're like, crap, they're right. Like I don't have X, Y, and Z. You can try to build a bridge to be like, well, I didn't know A, B, and C at the previous job and I learned it in two months. And by six months, I was able to have this kind of an impact, right? Like. It just gives you the opportunity to paint a more full picture when you think that you've kind of painted it and, and you know, maybe they haven't heard it quite or, or you just haven't, uh, you know, gone into enough detail about it. And finally, one of my favorite questions and the last question I ask in every interview I have ever done um, is, tell me about your biggest success or win at this company. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, because I want to see what success looks like at the company. I want to have an example of that. And two, that interview then ends with the hiring manager or whoever I'm interviewing with walking away with the memory of their biggest success and their biggest win talking to me about it. And I know it sounds odd, but there is definitely a subconscious just boost there <laughs> in terms of their opinion of me. And so I highly recommend asking that question, both for your sake, as well as just to leave on a very positive note on these interviews. I do wanna to get to some questions, but I, I am also just going to, to wanna to leave everyone on maybe also a bit of a, a high note, right? Like, Wes, that's all well and good, but like, I'm still lost. I don't really like know what I need to do in the real world at this point. So 
I'm going to leave it open to the group and, and especially for you, Christine, because I think you had some wonderful words about this. Like, what would you tell someone worried about their future and about the great beyond right now? Oh, man, this is this is why I, this is my favorite reason for these panels. By definition of you going to UCSD, you are already exceptional talent. Um, and if you have to tell yourself that in the mirror 10 times a day, start doing it. Because if you're anything like I was as, you know, a research nerd at the end of undergrad realizing, oh, I'm not going to go into research. What am I supposed to do with my career? And I've worked so hard to get to and through UCSD. And now I just feel like I'm, like I'm lost. I'm unmoored. And I, I like, I I feel like the littlest guppy in the pond. And you may also have friends around you at UCSD who are telling you about all of their great experiences and what they're gonna be when they grow up. And I, I cannot shout this loudly enough. The people that know what they want to do when they graduate college are the minority. Um, and more power to them. If you figure it out, Whew, you've spared yourself a lot of hard work, but it is not likely. And so when you start to look around at your friends as graduation is approaching and you're starting to panic because you don't know who you want to be or what you want to do, and you've worked yourself into this phenomenal world-class institution and worked your way through it, and you're feeling like you're lost and might be a failure, remember that you are actually part of the majority and the intellect and panache and drive that brought you to UCSD is going to be what the same drive that brings you to a great job. The road to getting your first job is bumpy. It is, it, it is for almost everyone. And if you, and my biggest piece of advice is to just start treating yourself like your best friend. Start rooting for yourself for every single informational interview you do and every job that doesn't feel like the right fit, but hey, you got through that interview and like you're sweating, but you did it. <laughs> and it, the more you root for yourself and remember like you didn't get here by accident. You didn't get through here by accident. That like the road feels really obscured now and it is going to become clearer and the drive that has helped you conquer all of these other challenges is what's gonna help you conquer this too. Um, as someone who started in HR and then moved into workplace science from my master's in IO, moved across the country, and then moved into customer experience strategy at a totally different company in technology, and then moved across the country again and worked a couple of different contract consulting jobs and now I work in biz ops for a tech company. It's okay to shop around and figure out what doesn't fit. And you're just going to keep landing on your feet and blinking like, how did I do it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's my spiel. <laughs> and reach out to me on LinkedIn if you need a little bit more affirmation. I'll build you up. Well, definitely reach out to all of us on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I mean that, right? Like y'all are doing more than the average just by coming to something like this right now now follow follow up right I, I just kind of put it in the chat in terms of like messaging people but like never stop at the first message right like follow the grapevine and the paper trail you know you've taken the first step don't stop here right connect with other people that are um you know whose <laughs> names and chat boxes are um you know showing up during this conversation um and i and and Continuing to do that is just going to take you that much further. Um, but yeah, I, I you know, th that's really all the stuff that I had. I could talk about so many more things for days, um, but I want to open it up for questions or if any of our panelists, Chris and Melissa, if you want to close out on any other comments. <laughs> I think what Christine said was so beautiful. Um, one thing I would just keep in mind too is be flexible and be open minded. So you might have all these ideas of where you want to go. My example of where I started at UCSD. I was in an executive assistant role within the first year. I was also an academic advising intake assistant. And I started back at iHouse with a four hour a week role. And I eventually grew that role to being 
part-time, 20 hours a week, um, worked on getting funding. I was the first person to do international alumni relations, and it got me to where I wanted to go next. And how, where I wanted to go, I did, I knew kind of in the back of my mind, but it went even bigger. I went to New York City and, you know, your career path is going to take so many different twists and turns. And, you know, coming back to San Diego, I just knew I wanted to be physically in San Diego. Did I know I wanted to be in a corporate position? Not exactly, but it was exciting and it was interesting and it was different and it was hard. It was a completely different culture. I think everyone's kind of commented on culture. It was a culture that I wasn't necessarily the obvious choice for. However, I was able to market myself for that role, for that team, for what they needed at that time. So keep that in mind as well. And I ended up loving my my career at Taylor Me Golf and it's what took me to Prana. Um, Another thing I think um, that's really important in addition to culture is making sure it aligns with your core values. So we talked a little bit about this, like if you're not showing up as your true self, making sure like I knew for personally, I wanted to marry that mission driven um, company ideal with my work. So Prana was a perfect example where it was business, it was digital marketing, but it was also a mission driven company. Um, so keep that in mind too, when you're searching, you know, open up your mind to what that might look like. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for everyone. It's going to be great. It's going to be challenging. That's not to say that we, we don't remember what it was like, but be open-minded because really that's when the best things happen. Wes, can I Absolutely. jump in? Yeah, please, Mike. Thank you, team. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I just want to reinforce the idea that you've heard several insights, tremendous insights, directly from the horse's mouth, sorry, panelists, uh, in terms of strategies, tips. The Career Center is here to assist any and all Tritons with navigating this entire process. We have a ton of events, info sessions. Employers are at our doorstep. So we encourage you to connect with us, eat, reach out to myself, shoot me an email, get connected through Handshake, uh, and we're here to help. Which is a great segue into a couple of tools that are at your disposal. Wes, forgive me if I'm uh, stepping on toes regarding- Go ahead, no, we're good. Um, but just an, a, a couple of examples in terms of some of the ways you can combine services with opportunities are represented here. Triton's Connect is pretty much a LinkedIn just for UCSD Triton alumni and the Triton community. Uh, what you see on the screen are some of the ways that you can leverage the tool to do many of the things that our panelists reinforced were important tips and suggestions. Reach out, connect with mentors, convey interest. Uh, we also have some events that are upcoming. If we could go to the next slide, you'll see some additional presentations, You'll see some recruiting events. You'll see some additional opportunities uh, to connect with employers and some of our industry partners. I could, thank you. Uh, I just want to reinforce some of the points that Christine made. Uh, so one of the roles that we have the opportunity to adhere to in the Career Center is an industry engagement piece. And so I can attest, we're on the front lines of dealing with companies and employers literally from all over the country internationally uh, that are trying to get connected to our events through handshake post positions to connect with Triton talent. Um, so just reinforcing the, the notion that we have a lot to offer the different companies and the career centers here to help you at every step along the way. Awesome. Well, I think, you know, that just about wraps it up. Um, you know, we're, we're at time at this point. I'm happy to, to invite everyone to, to, you know, hop off. If you have any questions, though, um, I'm happy to stick on and try to answer anything that, that anyone else has. Um, I know some more questions popped in here, but um, I really hope that this was useful for, for everyone involved.